Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. My name is Benjamin Quinn, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm so excited to welcome you to today's event with Jaya Ramji Nagalis, Andrew Sean Holtz, and Philip Schrag discussing their book, The End of Asylum, moderated by Julia Preston. Today's event is part of Harvard Bookstore's Friday Forum series, which takes place on Friday afternoons during the academic year as a way to highlight scholarly books in a wide range of fields. Though we remain digital for the time being, we have a full schedule of virtual events in the coming weeks as part of this afternoon series and others, so do check out our website for our complete event calendar. For today's event, we will conclude with some time for your questions. If you'd like to ask the speaker something, locate the Q&A function wherever I may live on your Zoom display, where you can submit all your questions. We'll get through as many as time allows. If you go to the chat section of this presentation, I will shortly be posting a link to our website where you can purchase your copy of The End of Asylum. If you already have a copy of the book or would like to contribute to the series and our store in a different way, I will also be posting in the chat a link to our website's donation function. We greatly appreciate any and all support you were able to extend to us at this time. And lastly, as you may know from the large virtual gatherings we've been attending this past year together, technical issues may come up. We do apologize in advance for that, if any technical glitches do occur, we will do our best to resolve them as quickly as possible. And now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. J.R. Ramji Nagalis is the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and I. Herman Stern Research Professor at Temple University's Beasley School of Law, where she created, along with her students, the Temple Law Asylum Project. In addition to today's book, she has published extensively on international refugee law and global migration law, as well as legal procedure and process. Andrew Schoenholtz is a professor of practice at the Georgetown University Law Center, where he's the co-director of the Asylum Clinic, the Center for Applied Legal Studies. His previous publications, which focus especially on the refugee convention and the US asylum system, include The New Refugees and the Old Treaty, Lives in the Balance, and Refugee Roulette, Disparities in Asylum Adjudication, among others. Philip Schrag is the Delaney Family Professor of Public Interest Law at the Georgetown University Law Center, where he teaches professional responsibility, as well as serves as the co-director of the Asylum Clinic. He is the author of 16 previous books and dozens of articles on asylum adjudication, legal ethics, legal education, and other topics of public law. Today, they are joined by moderator Julia Preston, a contributing writer at the Marshall Project. Before coming to the Marshall Project in 2017, she worked for 21 years at the New York Times, where she, along with a staff of four other reporters, won the 1998 Pulitzer Prize for Journalism. Today, they'll be discussing Jaya, Andrew, and Phillips' co-authored book, The End of Asylum, a comprehensive examination of the US asylum system, which New Yorker writer Sarah Stillman calls an urgently needed book and a genuine public service a meticulous account of how the Trump administration dismantled the country's humanitarian protections for asylum seekers and refugees. As we continue to reckon with the damage wrought and the new fearsome walls erected throughout the past four years, these three legal experts have given us an essential roadmap to adequately navigating and condemning the damage done. Tracing both the rise and the demise of asylum within the United States, the end of asylum brilliantly contends with a legal system in crisis, offering a critical stance on where we are now and how we can begin to recreate a system that offers shelter to those facing persecution. We are delighted to be hosting this event this afternoon. Without further ado, I am now delighted to turn things over to our speakers. The digital podium is yours, Julia and everyone. Hello, it's, thank you so much for inviting me to moderate this panel. And um, I, just wanted to start by stepping out for a few seconds of my role as a dispassionate moderator to say what an incredibly invaluable text you have written for anyone who cares about the Trump administration's impact on protections for immigrants and refugees in the United States. It is um, a lawyerly and non-polemical compendium of an onslaught and I have to say that there were moments when I was reading this when I, I had to stop and put it down. It's so overwhelming, the animus of the Trump administration towards people who are seeking protection uh, from the United States. And so I won't uh, 
go beyond that, but without, as they say, further ado, let's uh, start some questions so you can tell us about the book. So I guess I'm gonna address the first question to you, Jaya. Could you just tell us very briefly, what is asylum? How is asylum different from, what's the difference between an asylum seeker and a refugee? And, and bring us up to date from the Obama administration. How was the asylum system functioning under President Obama? Great, thanks so much, Julia. Thanks for moderating and thank you so much to the Harvard Bookstore for hosting. So, so I think the, the best place to start with asylum is um, to look to the international law because asylum comes from international treaty law that was designed to protect those fleeing serious harm. In our book, we, we term it the Holocaust as prologue, right? So, so it's really the lessons learned from the Holocaust where we saw very strict visa requirements, unused visa quotas, and of course the story that many know of the St. Louis, um, the, the ship full of Austrian and German Jews fleeing, um, the, fleeing uh, the Nazis who were turned back um, and, and many were, were killed um, in concentration camps and, and millions of course were murdered while the world um, sat and watched. So after the, the Holocaust, um, the international community came together um, to draft the Refugee Convention, which often offers protection to those who flee persecution, who have a well-founded fear of persecution on the basis of one of five grounds, race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or membership in a particular social group. So you have to show that you are fleeing persecution on one of those grounds. Asylum seekers, um, in contrast to refugees, are those who come to the border, um, come to the US, um, even those who come without a visa, both the convention and the statute say these folks should be protected and they seek protection from the US. And that's, that's what our book is really focused on. So this international treaty law was then implemented in US law through what's known as the Refugee Act of 1980. So that was aimed to right, bring the, the US law into conformity with international legal standards that we bound ourselves to as a nation. And also it was really Congress getting into the game. So ending what had previously been a very ad hoc executive system of admissions that the president, the executive just deciding when they were gonna bring in refugees and, and, and making asylum decisions. So instead what the Refugee Act was did was create a transparent legal process that applied the substantive legal standards laid out in the treaty through the asylum office, which is the, the, the first stop for many asylum seekers and also the immigration court, which also adjudicates asylum claims. So since 1980, since, since the act laid that out, I would say we've had a reasonably well-functioning asylum system, um, right? We, we have written books critical of the system, but it, overall it was reasonably well-functioning. There were some challenges by different presidents created by the executive, and Congress also made several changes um, to the asylum statute, including some that laid the seeds for the demolition of the asylum program. So, so let me just preview a little bit. Um, and I'll start with the 1996 immigration reform, the Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act signed by President Clinton. That set up the expedited removal program, which is now what you're seeing implemented at the border. So people who arrive without documents are given a chance to express a fear to, to express that they don't want to return because, because they have this fear of persecution. Um, those who express that fear go through a, what's known as a credible fear interview um, with an asylum officer. Um, and um, they are then, if, if they have a credible fear, they're moved into the asylum system. So initially this was only in place at air and land ports of entries. This was a very low threshold, this credible fear threshold. It was simply the idea that you could separate. And, and originally it was designed for when we had large groups of folks coming to the border saying, okay, these folks go to the asylum flow. These folks can be, can be removed quickly. Um, but in order to uphold our international and statutory obligations, we had to have that in there. Uh, and detention is authorized pending a final credible fear decision. It also put into place the one-year filing deadline, which, which we've written about before, which means if you file for asylum more than a year after entry, um, you, you're no longer eligible for asylum unless you meet one of a few exceptions. 
And then these provisions that Trump later abused were put into place, this safe third country, this idea that you can enter into agreement with a, with a country that had a robust asylum system like Canada, which we have an agreement with, and send asylum seekers back there if they arrived first in that country before coming to the US. And also this very obscure provision um, aimed at keeping um, folks with criminal convictions in Mexico pending their immigration court proceedings. So that's what happened in the 1996 law. And then we see some executive actions as we see increasing migrants coming from Central America. So under President Bush, we see increasing numbers of Central American mothers and children. He opens up what's known as the Hutto Family Detention Center in Texas. He also now expands the expedited removal process. So it applies to anyone who is apprehended within a hundred miles of the Southern border, right? So beyond the previous airports and seaports. Obama, which, which, which is what you asked about and where I'll end, initially looked like he was going to correct this. He closed the family detention center. He tried to repeal the one-year filing deadline. He issued, his Board of Immigration Appeals issued a very good decision on domestic violence, ARCG. But then he became concerned about being seen as soft on the border. So in 2014, we see another increase in violence in the Northern Triangle, more families at the border, most who demonstrated a credible fear of persecution, but he opened up a bunch of new detention centers in remote areas of, of New Mexico and Texas. So um, we're, we're with a functioning asylum system, but still some concerns about the treatment of families arriving at the border. Okay, and th so that sets us up. Uh, Phil, I'll go to you uh, with the next question. Um, uh, no, I'm sorry, Andy, I will go to you with the next question, which is, what did the Trump administration do to undermine the asylum process at the border? Pretty much everything it could possibly have done, Julia. Trump was obsessed with shutting down asylum at the US-Mexico border. So his administration tried and tried and tried until they found the policies that actually deterred large numbers of asylum seekers from coming. As Jay explained, people can seek asylum at a legal port of entry or after crossing the border unlawfully. That's what the statute permits. But the Trump administration distorted those laws to discourage people from seeking asylum in the US. And initially those deterrence policies didn't work as intended, but later ones did. And the administration experimented with practices that no previous administration, Republican or Democrat, had ever considered seriously, let alone tried. So what are the highlights? One of the first groups that the Trump administration wanted to deter were the families coming from the Northern Triangle countries, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. And in the spring of 2018, that's when Customs and Border Protection, CBP, agents separated thousands of children from their families, taking children away from the parents, prosecuting the parents, mothers and fathers for unlawfully entering the United States in between ports of entry. This policy shocked the consciences of many, including some Trump supporters, and ultimately Trump backed down. But even though family separation traumatized the children and parents, families from the Northern Triangle countries continue to arrive, even before Trump backed down. Then in November of 2018, Trump tried to bar asylum completely for all those who entered without permission. That didn't work because the statute was so clear that the courts enjoined the government from barring asylum in this way. And in a very rare instance, the Supreme Court actually allowed the lower court injunction to remain in place. So it was time for another experiment. This time in January of 2019, CBP began to implement the Remain in Mexico policy, which was announced with the Orwellian title of Migration Protection Protocols. Previously, there were pushbacks and metering, CBP agents physically blocked access, to the ports of entry told asylum seekers, Trump says we don't have to let you in. And metering became official policy at all Southern border ports in April, 2018, but that didn't stop people from seeking asylum. The numbers kept coming. Nor did the remain in Mexico policy deter initially. The arrivals actually increased significantly in February, 2019 and the number of new arrivals reached a new 13-year record high level in May 2019. 
That's when Trump threatened Mexico with tariffs. And the Mexican government then began to help Trump in a very big way. That was the turning point, I would say. Under Remain in Mexico, CBP returned more than 69,000 asylum seekers, including families and pregnant women, to wait in Mexico for their hearings. They hardly had access to lawyers. They suffered significant violence in the border towns because of criminal grant gangs and traffickers. And they often had their immigration hearings if they made it back into the United States for a hearing via video intent courts. Many of them were unable to attend their hearings. Some had been kidnapped. Others never received notice of their hearing date. And many found it too unsafe to wait in Mexico for long periods of time. Hardly any were granted uh, asylum and more than half were actually ordered deported by these immigration judges through these tent court proceedings in absentia. Then the experience became exponential. They threw everything they could to shut down the border to asylum seekers. In July, 2019, a second asylum ban barred asylum for anyone entering the, through the Mexican border who hadn't sought asylum in a country of transit and received a final decision. The intention was to eliminate asylum for everyone other than Mexicans who obviously weren't transiting Mexico, they were coming directly from there. That same summer, Trump asked Mexico and the Northern Triangle governments to allow the US to deport asylum seekers to their countries. The idea was the US wouldn't even consider a re the request for asylum and instead would force those countries to handle those asylum requests. Mex Mexico said no, despite the, the tariff threats to that request, because they realized that if they said yes, they'd be responsible for all the asylum seekers who were transiting their country to get to the US. But the weaker Northern Triangle governments agreed. And so in November 2019, the Trump administration began deporting families from El Salvador and Honduras to Guatemala, pursuant to the Asylum Cooperative Agreement, as they called it. The Trump administration also was long frustrated by the fact that the vast majority of asylum seekers demonstrated a credible fear of persecution and then were given a chance to seek asylum before an immigration judge. So first they tried to undermine the asylum screening substantively. That didn't get them too far. Then they had CBP agents conduct asylum screening starting in June, 2019. Notice that important month. That's when they really figured out how to do this. That helped some, but they wanted to make it practically impossible for the screening to be successful. So in the fall of 2019, they invented super swift processes, even quicker than regular expedited removal to deport people within days of arrival. So together with these deportation policies, the Remain in Mexico policy did deter families and others from seeking asylum. The number of arrivals declined by almost 75% by January of 2020. And then the Trump administration distorted a law focused on a health issue into one that pretty much ended asylum at the southern border. Over the objection of CDC's expert director, Vice President Pence directed the CDC to issue an order that would result in the exclusion of almost all arriving asylum seekers starting in March, 2020. The COVID-19 expulsions as they're sometimes called are the most expedited of all removals. CBP averages 96 minutes per person in the actual removal. And DHS has removed more than 600,000 people this way. Yeah, 96 minutes. Yeah. From the time the person is apprehended to the time that person is back over the border back in Mexico. Precisely. That's what you call very limited due process. <laughs> exactly. Um, so I think that really paints a comprehensive outline of how the Trump administration shut down the asylum process at the border. Phil, tell us what was going on in terms of the court system inside the country with the people who were making decisions as to whether to grant asylum or not. So asylum under the law is to be granted to anybody who 
is it the United States or at its border who has a well-founded fear of persecution on account of that person's race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or membership in a particular social group? And there are two ways to seek asylum. If you haven't been arrested first, apprehended, such as at the border, you can apply affirmatively and your case is initially adjudicated by an asylum officer at the Department of Homeland Security. If you've been apprehended, your first adjudication is by an immigration judge uh, who is actually a, not a judge, but a official of the Department of Justice. Trump went after both sets of adjudications, both the DHS and at the Department of Justice. So for example, for affirmative applicants, people who are seeking asylum, having arrived uh, at the United States on a student visa or a tourist visa, but who were afraid to go back home, they would normally file a uh, application for asylum on a form that was pretty complicated even before Trump got a hold of it. Uh, it was, uh, it's a very long form with a very long instruction manual for how to fill it out and a lot of spaces to fill out. Uh, and Trump, uh, so what are the spaces? Well, the first spaces on the form are give your name, name, first name, middle name, last name. Some people don't have middle names, but Trump established a process where if you left any field blank on this form, for example, the middle name field, when you didn't have a middle name, your application would be rejected. You had to write NA in that space instead of leaving it blank in order for it to be considered. And of course, people who don't speak English may not know about the NA abbreviation for not applicable. Um, so he made the, the application process itself arduous. He also instituted a regime of charging fees for asylum applications. Uh, previous to the Trump administration, there had never been a fee for applying for asylum. Trump instituted the fee for the first time. Uh, in the uh, the substantive in the area, the substantive rules for applying for 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 winning asylum, as I mentioned, you could win asylum uh, if you were uh, persecuted on account of being a member of a particular social group. As Jaya mentioned in 2014, the uh, Board of Immigration Appeals had decided it was possible for a victim of domestic violence to be a member of a particular social group. So that if a person, if a spouse or girlfriend was uh, beaten up or raped by a boyfriend or husband uh, and sought protection in the United States, they could win on that ground. Attorney General Sessions issued a, uh, an opinion in 2018, the famous matter of AB opinion, overturning that 2014 uh, precedent so that it was impo became impossible uh, for most domestic violence victims to be considered a social group and therefore to win asylum. Trump then appointed about two thirds of all of the current sitting immigration judges. There are about 500 uh, current immigration judges and Trump appoint has appointed about two thirds of them. You know, there's a, a big uproar in the paper that Trump has uh, appointed about a quarter of the federal judiciary. Well, this is far more than a quarter of the immigration judges that he's appointed. And most of those he appointed have law enforcement backgrounds. Uh, uh, Jaya and Andy and I showed in a previous book that the longer an immigration judge had an enforcement background or enforcement occupation or work before becoming an immigration judge, the lower their grant rate was as an immigration judge. Uh, and most of these new appointees did have such backgrounds and the denial rate for asylum among the judges soared from 55% to 72% as a result of these new appointments. He also appointed the judges with the lowest grant rates in asylum cases to the appellate court that reviews immigration court decisions. And these people will be in place there on the appellate body for a very long time, just as the Trump judges in the federal court system will be there for a very long time. Also, as he was leaving office after losing his uh, uh, reelection bid, Trump really accelerated the process for uh, denying asylum and changing the system. 
he issued a new final regulation after he lost the election to bar asylum for most victims of domestic violence, embodying it in a regulation that couldn't easily be overturned by a, a new decision, uh, and for LGBTQ uh, individuals who are attacked by homophobic people. Uh, this is a new regulation uh, that made it very, very difficult, if not impossible, for them to be members of a social group unless their persecutor had persecuted not only them, but other people like them. So if a, a batterer attacked only one woman, only, the, only his spouse or girlfriend, and not all women, then that woman wasn't a member of a social group because uh, he hadn't attacked everybody in her class. He, uh, the new regulation also specified that death threats don't count as persecution unless somebody had tried to follow through on the threats. So unless somebody actually tried to kill you, the threat doesn't count. The, the, the fact that it was a uh, pretty credible threat was not good enough. He instructed uh, the attorney general under Trump, instructed uh, 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 the, under this regulation, the attorney general was to uh, instruct immigration judges that he, the attorney general, would not look with favor on grants of asylum based on gender meaning that immigration judges who work for the attorney general and can be punished for disobeying the attorney general should deny gender-based cases. And he proposed a rule directing immigration judges to deny many asylum cases on the basis of the application form alone without allowing the applicant to testify about his experience of persecution. So a person who arrives in the United States, doesn't speak English well, doesn't know how to fill out the form correctly, doesn't give enough details about the nature of the persecution and the reasons for the persecution on the form, could be denied asylum without ever having a chance to testify or a day in court. Now, those are just a few of the ways in which Trump perverted the asylum process. Uh, in the book, we, dis we discuss, I think, close to 50, probably about 48 different ways in which Trump uh, cumulatively uh, made it a, 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 came as close as he possibly could to destroying the process altogether. Um, before we go on to the next round of questions, Jay, I wonder if you could just take a minute or two just to summarize this whole picture that you paint in the book. What, what's the cumulative effect? Where is the asylum system right now as Joe Biden is taking up the, the challenge of trying to restore some of these, um, some of these protections. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, so um, the overall impact has really been devastating. And, and I have to say, if we had had a different outcome in the election, the presidential election and in the, in the congressional election, um, the asylum system would have been over. I, I think there, we would not have been able to resuscitate it. So so what did they did these changes do? They ended access to asylum for many, many genuine refugees. So we really seen the destruction um, as Phil and Andy laid out of both the system and the substantive law. Um, so the borders actually right now are still largely closed to asylum seekers using this Title 42 COVID pandemic closure that Andy talked about. They're letting through unaccompanied children, maybe some families, um, but they're largely closed as Biden tries to deal with this enormous mess that the Trump administration left at the border. So um, the, the Trump administration also decimated the infrastructure. Um, that, that um, is necessary, right? Any kind of humanitarian infrastructure that we might need to see at the border, um, it, elsewhere um, inside the country. So, right, losing human resources, losing other kinds of resources, um, right? And, and so Biden is also faced with the, the economic um, recession, right? So, so managing, the, trying to build this up but with limited resources is gonna be a challenge. And then of course, um, the, the, 
the pandemic challenges come into play. The other thing that I just really want to emphasize is that the Trump administration sent a very dangerous message about asylum and immigrants. So prior to this administration, um, refugee, refugee protection, the asylum system, um, was an area of immigration law that was supported by Republicans and Democrats alike. Um, so it was really a the one area within immigration law where we saw common ground. Um, and now we've just seen that um, split apart. And, and, and we've also seen just this incredibly um, um, harmful rhetoric coming out of the administration that we'll be dealing with um, for years to come, I'm afraid. Um, so let's try and uh, sort out what the situation is right now. Um, Andy, I wonder if you could break down a little bit for uh, for us, w what are we seeing today? How has this process of change by the Trump administration uh, affected what we're seeing today? I think it's a, a confusing picture. People don't understand who's getting in, who's not getting in, why the Biden administration is saying, look, we need time to solve this problem. I mean, do they really need time? Excellent question. So let's get some context about what's happening at the US-Mexico border. First of all, it's a very small part of what is a, an extraordinary global displacement. 1% of the world's population, about 80 million people, have fled their homes as a result of conflict or persecution. 85% of the displaced are in developing countries. About a third have crossed an international border to find safety, maybe about 26 million refugees, and around a half of those refugees are under the age of 18. So it's no surprise that we're seeing unaccompanied children again at our borders, right? Second, for the last year, those coming across the U.S.-Mexico border have predominantly been what CBP calls single adults, meaning adults traveling on their own. But the numbers reported involve repeat crossers, not individuals. In other words, people who tried to cross a, more than one time. So it's hard to know just how many people are involved. Certainly there are increased encounters, which is how the Border Patrol talks about it. But in the global context, it's not a border crisis. March did see increased arrivals of unaccompanied children and families. So with respect to the children who are arriving without a parent, it's not just the asylum laws, Julia, that allow them to seek safely, safety. The Trafficking Victims Protection Reauthorization Act requires that the children be treated humanely. So the border agents under the TVPRA, as it's called, must quickly transfer the children to the care of a different agency, Health and Human Services where it's the responsibility of the Office of Refugee Resettlement to reunify the children if they have close family in the US, which many do, or to find, find them proper care. Then the children can pursue claims for asylum or other legal immigration statuses uh, specifically established by Congress, such as special immigrant juvenile status. The goal with respect to the children is to try to do what's in their best interest. Now, Trump ignored both the asylum laws and the TVPRA in immediately deporting over 8,800 unaccompanied children by last October under the pretextual health law. Biden refused to misuse those health laws against these children. Instead, he's trying to respect the TVPRA, Congress's statute, and ensure that CBP agents quickly transfer the kids to their proper custodians. And yes, it will take some time to make that work better because neither CBP nor ORR, the Office of Refugee Resettlement, is prepared. Ultimately, hopefully, the Biden administration will configure and resource the appropriate personnel to make it work as the TVPRA requires. The question is, why is the government unprepared to handle the kids at the border right now? No administration has handled increased arrivals well. That's, that's the history. But the previous administration, the Trump administration, left the agency that takes care of the kids in terrible shape without the resources needed to respond. So it's no surprise at all that they're trying to rebuild right now. Two quick final comments 
on families and the so-called single adults. The families fleeing violence, especially those who are trying to rejoin family already in the US, they're gonna to continue to come from the Northern Triangle countries until the failing governments there can protect all their citizens and control all their territory. Human insecurity and corruption where police, gangs and organized drug cartels work together are really serious problems. And establishing the rule of law in those three countries will take time. No administration to date has seriously tried to address those problems. Perhaps the Biden administration will, it's suggested that it will try, but it's way too early to tell what will happen. With regards to the adults, my final comment, Homeland Security reported last year that the vast majority of these single adults were in, they encountered were Mexican males, many of whom were trying to rejoin their families in the US. If that's the main source of these single adults, then such family reunification is connected to Congress not reforming the legal immigration system for over 30 years and addressing the situation of undocumented families. The vast majority who, which have lived in the United States on average for 15 years. So it's hard to imagine that those people will continue to try to reunite with their families. Um, so Phil, a question for you. The, the, the last chapter of your book is a very useful menu of items of change that uh, the Biden administration might undertake. And um, I understand it hasn't been uh, long uh, that they've been in office and your book has just uh, been published now, but uh, bring us up to date. Uh, it, how is Biden doing on your scorecard of items that, of change? We not really issue a scorecard yet, but he's done some things and he's disappointed us in not doing others. So he did end the blank spaces policy. If you left out your middle name, uh, you can still apply for asylum. He, as Andy said, he's following the law in allowing unaccompanied children into the United States to make asylum claims, although he's not following the law in allowing the adults to come into the United States to uh, make asylum claims. And we understand, you know, we can all understand that that will take some time uh, to happen, but really he should be working on uh, ending the policy of using COVID as an excuse to uh, keep people out. Lots of people are coming in from Mexico. It's just these uh, migrants who are not coming in, but uh, a lot of people are coming over the Mexican border legally every single day, uh, Americans and non-Americans. Uh, Biden suspended the agreements with the that uh, such as the one that the ones that have been mentioned with uh, the Northern Triangle countries. So we are no longer sending Hondurans and Sal and Salvadorans to Guatemala uh, without giving them any process. Uh, he stopped the putting new asylum applicants into the Mexico program, the Re Remain in Mexico or MPP program, where they were victims of kidnappings and rapes. And he's allowing a small number of the people uh, for, who were put into that program by Trump to come into the United States and have a day in court. Uh, he ended the super rapid uh, uh, programs through which people were being given expedited, expedited removal and uh, being turned around uh, very quickly uh, with hearings, but very quick hearings. Uh, but all of these measures are essentially symbolic because except for the unaccompanied children and families with very young children, everybody's still being expelled within hours uh, under the so-called COVID restrictions. Uh, so, you know, it doesn't matter very much that he suspended the agreements with Guatemala and so forth because everybody's being expelled anyway. What else hasn't Biden yet done? Well, there haven't been new attorney general opinions reversing the bad opinions of attorneys generals uh, sessions and bar, such as the AB opinion that, uh, against uh, asylum for domestic violence victims. He has not settled the cases that in which preliminary injunctions have been entered against many of Trump's uh, regulations. So those decisions are very, those 
although preliminary injunctions were entered, those rules are still on the books subject to the preliminary injunctions. And if the injunctions are dissolved, those terrible regulations can bounce back. Those cases need to be settled by vacating the Trump rules. Uh, the uh, transit ban, the ban that said that if you enter through Mexico without having sought asylum and, and had a decision in Mexico is still on the books. It's been enjoined temporarily. The Biden administration has said it's reviewing it, has not made a commitment to get rid of it. There's been no decision yet. Uh, the Trump administration issued a rule, and this is very troubling, saying that uh, for certain asylum applicants, those who are um, uh, in uh, class, special class of asylum seekers, where they're given only the opportunity to seek asylum in immigration court, not other kinds of relief. The Trump administration issued a rule saying that they had to apply for asylum within 15 days of their first hearing, or they'd be barred from seeking asylum. Very, such a short time that nobody can meet that deadline. That was enjoined preliminarily. And here's the shocker, By the Biden administration filed an appeal in that case against the preliminary injunction. And of course, the policy of letting in the unaccompanied children and not their parents is a new kind of family separation. So Trump was criticized tremendously by, from everybody from, from the Pope to his own daughter for instituting a policy of forced family separation. But the policy of letting in the unaccompanied children who leave their parents behind to seek asylum in the United States and then not admitting their parents is a Biden kind of family separation. Um, I think we're right on the time when we need to start taking questions, if that's all right with you. Um, uh, we have some, uh, some quite interesting questions and I'm gonna start with uh, one that uh, a person asked, could you talk a little bit about the legal approach taken by the Trump administration? Were he and his team able to exploit loopholes in pre-existing, uh, in the pre-existing order, or are we talking about an administration that really just absolutely anything and everything to court to see what they could get away with? So maybe uh, who would like to take that question? Jay, I'll take, I'll, I'll okay, take that Bill, question. Go ahead. Yeah, Congress was sloppy. Congress often passes laws that have uh, vague terms or bounce hard policy issues to the executive branch. And one of the ways they did that is that they said there are certain prohibitions on people getting asylum. For example, if they uh, have committed certain felonies, they can't get asylum. And then Congress put a catch-all clause at the end of the bars to asylum. And they said people can also be barred under uh, regulations that the attorney general makes consistent with this statute. Consistent with. That's a pretty vague term. And it's also an open, that clause is an open-ended invitation to the administration. And that's the clause that the administration hung their hat on, for example, in saying that if you came through Mexico without having applied uh, for asylum in Mexico, you're barred from asylum. Whether that's consistent with or inconsistent with the statute remains to be determined by the courts, right? But meanwhile, the, the, the loose language that Congress used, allowing the Attorney General to uh, write new regulations with new bars is a kind of loophole that the Trump administration uh, was happy to walk through. I, I just like to comment on that because I, I see it a little differently than exactly the way Phil's put it. Congress constantly writes sometimes in more general terms. There's nothing unusual about it. They never in a million years expected an administration to do what this administration does. To me, the fault really lies with this administration taking advantage of anything it could, even trying, as Jay was talking about it, you know, earlier, even trying, you know, to use the statute that was clearly written to say that asylum would be banned. So I think the large fault is really with the executive branch. So the challenge in the future, there I agree with Phil, the challenge in the future is 
Congress will have to speak very explicitly and very clearly to prevent a future administration from doing the sort of damage the Trump administration did. Sorry. Uh, we have a question uh, that kind of maybe Jaya can elaborate on that uh, a little more. The question is, what are the challenges the current administration faces regarding asylum and its reinstatement? So maybe you can give some idea of how hard is this going to be? Yeah, I mean, four years is a really short time. <laughs> um, and, and there are a lot of challenges. And as Phil and Andy just said, um, so, right, some of those challenges can be resolved by the administration itself. And so the administration has more time on that. We're, we're certain of that, um, has the full four years. But some of them need c Congress to step in and how long, right, Congress will be amenable to this, um, right? We're not sure. We're not, we're not sure how, how long that we're going to have to to um, to to unpack all of this. So I think one of the main challenges is what Phil spoke about is that there are, there's just now just a tangled mess of right policies. So right MPP is announced in a press release, right? There's a which which is easy to to undo, but then we have some regulations that have been put into place, and, and disentangling those is complicated because you have to go through an entire notice and comment process. It takes a long time. You have to justify why you're making this change. Otherwise, you can be sued um, for uh, under what's known as the Administrative Procedures Act for changing course, right? So, and this is this was the basis of the, a lot of the lawsuits against the Trump administration. So, so as Phil said, again, there are some ways we can, um, the, the administration um, can settle those lawsuits, right? So, so that, that may be a way and, and vacate the underlying rules, but there's so much <laughs> happening um, and there are so many changes to be made that I, I think it's gonna take nearly the full four years just to undo that and, and combine that with the fact that as we were talking about, the four of us were talking about before we went live, um, right? The administration is still trying to seek these positions, to seek to fill these positions because the Trump administration really unlike other prior administrations didn't um, allow right the, the the Biden team to start rebuilding, um, and so so it's still trying to get people appointed. It's still trying to fill these positions. It's still trying to ramp up the infrastructure, um, and and so I think a lot of these things. Right, my question about I think right Phil has a good point that it's incredibly disturbing that the Biden administration appealed. Um, one of these decisions, but is that just because someone at the top doesn't know what's going on and there's still someone who came in under Trump there who's who's seeking to undermine the system. So there's just so much work to be done. And then of course, um, you know, Andy talked about uh, the humanitarian response at the border and, and there's just, you know, what we're seeing is a demographic shift um, and, and what we have at the border right now responds to the prior demographics of who used to come, which is single men largely looking for jobs so they could support their families. But we've seen a shift right since the Bush administration to seeing families with children. And so now we need a humanitarian response at the border, not a militarized response at the border. And what we have is a militarized borders. But obviously putting together that humanitarian response takes time. Um, so, so there, there, there's a lot, um, there's a lot of work to be done there, um, and um, a lot of challenges in 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 ramping things up in the face of, especially particularly at the border, in the face of just overwhelming need. Just as an example of what Jay is saying, um, in the Justice Department, we have an Attorney General and a Deputy Attorney General now, but it's April 9th. Biden was inaugurated on January 20th. We have no associate attorney general and not one assistant attorney general has been confirmed. Yeah, the, the basic infra, uh, infrastructure to borrow a, another word that we're talking about these days and use it in a different context, the basic underpinnings are not there at the moment. And there's no director of the immigration court system. Yeah. Um, we have a question that is, could you talk a bit about how this asylum crisis plays out in the larger structure of international relations? Um, Andy, I think this question is for you. You mentioned that Trump used these new structures to threaten foreign governments and markets with tariffs and other regulations. Was this new legal precedent a way of punishing and controlling our neighbors? Well, I think it's pretty clear the, the Trump administration was so upset 
at the arrivals of more and more families with children um, from the Northern Triangle countries that they thought they would be able to control. And as I explained, it took quite a while until they did figure it out. They did figure it out, you know, by the middle of 2019, but it took them a long time. And so they were really upset about this and obsessed with it. And so there was no question, you know, what Trump was all, always going to use something that would get another government to do what he, his bidding, what he wanted. Um, okay, maybe he didn't get Mexico to build the physical wall, but he got them to construct a virtual wall. Um, and that was through the Remain in Mexico program. And besides what he got them to do through this serious tariff threat was to guard on their Southern border with Guatemala where all the people coming up from Latin America, Central America, whether they're Africans who are coming in that way. By, by the way, Julie, that's how many of the African asylum seekers make it to the United States. They come out up through that dangerous route. They've got to cross that border from Guatemala into Mexico. And the Mexicans established a new national guard that was supposed to be civil, but it was largely military at the beginning. They really control that Southern border better and the northern border and stop people from even getting to the ports of entry at Trump's bidding. So yes, he did use his those powers to, you can say, call it however you want it. If it's punished, you know, it's punished, but he really was just trying to shut the border and he would do anything necessary to do that. It's a very sad story in the, when you think about the long-term values that Republican and Democratic administrations have um, have, been, have really uh, uh, promoted for so many years since the Refugee Act of 1980 to help to encourage other countries to protect refugees. The United States, before Trump, was always encouraging other countries to protect refugees, and that clearly was not anything Trump could care less about, and. He was going to use whatever powers he needed to stop that from happening. I believe that with this administration, there will be more of that, um, that uh, interest in promoting refugee protection. The issue will be, as it always is, do we do it in the United States too, or do we just tell others to do it? Um, we have a question uh, that is a brief question, but it, it actually uh, invites an interesting answer. It is, for these fear interviews, what qualifies as afraid enough? Yeah, I-, Jaya, I can, Jaya you wanna take that? Yeah. Absolutely, I can, I can jump in there. Um, so the, the credible fear standard is that you have to be able to show a significant possibility that you can establish a well-founded fear of persecution. So of course it rides on this definition of a well-founded fear. And the Supreme Court uh, defined many years ago, a well-founded fear is a 10% chance um, that you will face persecution if, on the basis of one of those five grounds that we spoke about um, if you return to your country. So the credible fear standard is much lower than that because you just have to show a significant possibility that you'll meet that well-founded fear standard. And that's um, right, the idea when this was designed, we've, we've spoken to a, a couple of the, the people who, who designed expedited removal are now immigration law professors when we've spoken to them um, about what they were thinking when they put this together. And really the idea was, that it would just be this very, very low screening standard. So you could sort anyone who had a plausible asylum claim um, and, and right, bring them in um, and then say, actually, you know, the folks who don't have a plausible asylum claim, um, who, who don't have a, a, a valid reason to come and seek protection um, can be kept out. Um, so, so it's, it's a very low standard. It was being applied <laughs> by the Trump administration that the rates of credible fear granting, Andy and Phil might have those off the top of their head, but um, the rates of granting credible fear went way down under the Trump administration because these, the, first of all, these are supposed to be decisions made by asylum officers um, and the Trump administration was having them made by Customs and Border Patrol um, who are just, who are border enforcement officials. They're not trained in asylum determinations, um, making these 
these important decisions. So, right, that's another policy change that that, that Biden um, can easily make. Um, and, and then even the asylum officers under the Trump administration were being much, much harsher in, um, in, in these credible fear determinations. Here's another technical example of what Trump did in that context. Under previous administrations, an officer making a credible fear determination was supposed to apply the law of the circuit most favorable to the applicant because the uh, the asylum applicants were going all over the country to all these different circuits and the circuits had somewhat different standards in applying the uh, congressional law. So whatever the most favorable law was, the asylum officers were supposed to apply. The Trump administration said, no, don't do that. Apply the law of where the border is. And since the border, the Texas border, is, it, which is where most of the people came, were coming in, is in the Fifth Circuit, and the Fifth Circuit is the most conservative circuit in the country, the uh, asylum officers were told to apply the most conservative possible law, not the most progressive possible interpretation of the law. That's just one of hundreds of small, subtle ways in which the Trump administration uh, tried to keep people out. We just have a few minutes left, but I'm going to uh, exercise my right as moderator to ask a question of my own, which is, um, you know, we have a backlog in the immigration court system now of million and 1.3 million cases. And to be honest with you, over the years in my reporting, I've come to believe that a lot of those folks are not going to prevail because they really are not the as asylum seekers who even in the most favorable interpretation of the law uh, have a powerful case. And a lot of the folks that have gotten into the system are really people who wanna come to the United States, be able to work, reunite with their families and they've gotten sort of tangled up in the asylum system in a way that has, I think weakened the whole system. So my question is in two minutes, can this system be reformed on its own by itself? Or do we require a rethinking of the border to allow other channels for people to uh, come legally to the United States who want to work or be with their families? Yeah, it's a great question. I'll take a first stab and I'm sure Phil and Andy will have thoughts about that. So, so the, the place I wanna start is that reasons for migration are very complex it's very difficult to isolate one reason someone moves. So, so just taking the Central American example, right? So if we're thinking about folks who are kind of small holding um, subsistence farmers in, in Central America, they're facing climate change, right? Which has led to a major drought, which has led to two devastating hurricanes, Ada and Iota in November of 2020. That's layered over existing social inequality, um, so and, and government real negligence towards the urban, and rural, and poor population. So they're just not taking care of, of these folks when when they face um, these climate change challenges. So then, looking for work. Um, these rural folks would have to move into the urban areas, which we know in these Northern Triangle countries, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras, um, particularly the poor neighborhoods are choked by gang violence. Um, and so, and we also know that these gangs specifically target children for a variety of reasons. Um, so it's just very hard to lead a sustainable life for so many reasons. Asylum requires you to put those reasons into, right, one of five boxes. Um, and, and so, Folks who deserve protection, folks who need to move may not fit in one of those five boxes and people may legitimately be seeking jobs that are available in the US labor market, <laughs> that the US labor market needs to fill with migrant labor. Uh, and, and so I, my main point here is that asylum law, which as I said at the beginning was created to respond to World War II, just can't manage this all on its own, right? The law itself, we talked about how the law of asylum itself needs updating, right, to, to cover um, gang-based claims, right, where the persecutor is a gang or a cartel to cover domestic violence claims. The law itself needs updating, but we also need other routes. We need paths, safe and lawful paths for labor migrants to come because there are jobs. We need it, at, um, at, as Phil and Andy spoke to, we, family reunification has been 
long been a fundamental principle of immigration law. And again, we need some updating to enable, right? Most of these kids coming to the border, no one's done a statistical study, but from the folks we speak to, most of these unaccompanied kids coming to the border are seeking to reunify with their parents. And if there was a way to make that reunification happen, but that requires congressional action. Um, so there's still a lot, as we've spoken about, that the executive can do, but Congress really needs to step up and, and update um, our, our immigration law. One of the right. interesting things is that Americans like immigration. They don't like illegal immigration. So one of the things Congress can do is to regularize more legal immigration, and then we'd have less illegal immigration. Well, we're exactly at one o'clock. Andy, I'm sure you have many minutes of thoughts about that issue as well, but um, I just, I think we want to thank the Harvard Bookstore for uh, hosting this talk. I thank uh, the audience for the questions and really tremendously informative discussion. And I really urge people to read this book. It is, it is a very powerful um, guide to the change that needs to happen going forward in this system. Thank you so much, Julia. Really appreciate the conversation today. Yeah, thank you. And, and thanks in particular for all the really thoughtful questions from the audience. I'm sorry we couldn't get to them all. And thanks yes. to the Harvard Bookstore. Yes, thank you. And thank you all for this fantastic conversation, including the audience for your wonderful questions. Um, as I, as you've seen, I've put the uh, per link to purchase the book a couple times in the chat. Um, so please check out the book and please check out some of the other links I put in the chat. Um, on behalf of Harvard Bookstore here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, enjoy your weekend, keep reading and stay safe, everyone. Thanks again. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.